Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily's The Sidebar, taking you inside the courtrooms of high-profile and notorious cases from across the country. I'm your host, Joshua Ritter. I'm a criminal defense lawyer based here in Los Angeles and previously an L.A. County prosecutor for nearly a decade. You can find me at joshuaritter.com. We are recording this on Friday, November 18th, 2022. In this week's episode, the historic financial collapse of crypto exchange FTX after alleged diverting user funds for personal gain, as well as Lori Vallow Daybell, the mother accused of killing her two children for her doomsday beliefs, has been found competent to stand trial in a new ruling by an Idaho judge. We'll also discuss closing arguments in Danny Masterson's rape trial as jury decides the actor's fate. And finally, emotional testimony from the governor's wife, Jennifer Newsom, in Harvey Weinstein's sexual assault trial here in Los Angeles. Today, we are excited to be joined by Renato Mariotti, a former federal prosecutor, political writer, legal analyst, and host of It's Complicated podcast. Welcome. Thanks. Good to join you. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, before we jump right in, uh, I want our listeners to, to know a little bit about you. So could you please tell us about your background and current practice? Sure. Uh, I uh, I went to Yale Law School and was at a law firm, but then spent almost a decade as a federal prosecutor, uh, mostly prosecuting white collar crime, uh, large scale frauds, uh, uh, high frequency trading, that sort of thing. Now I've got a practice uh, handling all sorts of uh, uh, not only criminal defense, but also civil enforcement, and lots of other civil cases. Uh, and as you said, I'm, I have a podcast and do a lot of legal analysis and, and all that good stuff. Well, we are excited to hear your thoughts on these cases, especially this first case we're going to talk about, given your background at the uh, prosecutor's office. Let's jump right in. Uh, talking out of Manhattan, New York, the office of the U.S. Attorney's Office is reportedly preparing criminal charges against Sam Bankman Freed, also known as SBF, and his FTX crypto exchange. This comes after reports that the company diverted customer funds to back a company named Alameda, which acted as a, as a crypto hedge fund also allegedly owned and operated by SBF. In regulated markets, the use of customer funds for proprietary trading is forbidden without investor consent. However, in unregulated crypto markets, the same protections don't exist. The company, which has since filed for bankruptcy, listed in the terms of its service that users owned the cryptocurrencies in their account, stating, none of the digital assets in your account are the property of or shall be loaned to FTX trading. John J. Ray, who has helped oversee some of the biggest bankruptcies ever, including Enron's, said in a filing to federal bankruptcy court that he has never seen anything as bad in 40 years of restructuring firms. Ray said that FTX suffered a complete failure of corporate controls that culminated in an unprecedented debacle. Pretty strong words there, Renato. Jump right in. What exactly appears to have happened here from what we've learned so far? Wow. Well, a lot uh, is almost yeah. impossible to sum up. But at the, bo- the bottom line is this, you know, FTX was an exchange where, like you said a moment ago, Josh, you deposit your money and you could use it to trade crypto. Just like if you went to, uh, you know, let's say you're depositing your money at E-Trade, you want to trade some right. stocks. Right. Well, you assume when you put your million dollars into E-Trade that they're not taking your million dollars and off doing other things with it. You expect you can withdraw your money when you want. You can trade your stocks. And what happened with FTX is they were actually loaning that money to Alameda, that that entity you mentioned. They were also using that money for other purposes. There's actually that uh, Mr. Ray mentioned there's a billion dollar loan to SBF himself. Uh, Kind of bizarre. Other loans made doesn't seem well. They didn't seem to be well documented, but loans made to other executives. So obviously there appears to be a fraud uh, uh, to the uh, customers of FTX and and putting also it, by the, putting yeah. it mildly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and also appears to be fraud as to the Alameda customers. It takes a lot of skill to do multiple frauds at once, but it appears the Alameda, the Alameda folks, you know, that was a hedge fund. You know, when you invest in a hedge fund, the idea is that these hedge fund wizards are going to be trading and and investing and doing a great job making money for you. Instead, what they invested in was this um, token that uh, is used, or this, this, this crypto uh, instrument that is used in FTX to pay for FTX transaction costs. So basically, if you traded on FTX, you had to use this FTT token to pay for the transaction fees. 
And obviously, SBF wants to keep the value of that up. So what they did is they took the Alameda investors' money and poured that into FTT to prop up the price of that. Uh, so it really looks like you defrauded both of them at once. And we are talking here, Josh, like billions, like maybe $9 yeah. billion, a massive fraud, that probably the biggest we've seen since the Madoff case. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 all that you explained sounds so outrageous and so also kind of clumsy, right? I mean, it's not like it, it looks as though a lot of this fraud were taking place out in the open almost, right? How one, how do you think they got away with this? Is this is this just lack of regulation? And is this so fraudulent and so, you know, un, uh, unescapable that they're going to be facing criminal charges here? What are your thoughts? Well, the last question is easy. OK, yeah, the SBF is going to be facing criminal charges. He's in real trouble. Uh, and by the way, this guy doesn't stop talking, right? He's yeah. giving interviews to the New York Times. He's tweeting his tweet threads. He's doing DMs where he's like, yeah, everything just kind of got away from me or whatever. <laughs> and my altruism was just an actor, you know, all this, all this right, crazy right. stuff he's saying, right. but, but putting all that to the side, you know, well, how this happened. I mean, certainly, you know, when, when you quoted Mr. Ray talking about the, the lack of corporate controls, that almost like understates it. I mean, what they were doing there, like if you were an employee at FTX, you had an expense that you needed uh, approval for, you would just put it in a chat that would disappear over time and they would put an emoji up or down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They were, uh, and now yeah, it, it was, was it was like, can I buy a plane? And it would be astronaut emoji, meaning go for it. I mean, it's just insane what the way they were operating. Right. No board meetings, you know, these loans going back and forth. I mean, the, the billion dollar loan is one thing, but there was hundreds of millions loaned to others. I mean, very bizarre. So yeah, look, a lot of, uh, there was just money flowing in. I mean, I definitely think that part of the product of the issue here is a lot of money was flowing in based on trust and a charismatic personality. You know, SBF was putting himself out there as like the next Steve Jobs or something. The first, you know, on path to be the first trillionaire, the world's first trillionaire, all this stuff. And uh, I do think that's part of it. I think part of it is lack of regulation. That The thing that the folks at SBF are going to learn very quickly, though, is whether there's regulation of some of these specifics um, or not, there's no question that fraud is regulated by a whole slew of entities, including the United States Department of Justice. And whether you defraud people in baseball cards, tulip bulbs, or crypto, uh, you're in trouble if you end up doing that. And that's that's the reality of where they're at. I'm glad that you explained that that way, that just because the industry isn't as highly regulated doesn't mean you can't be committing crimes that don't run afoul of a whole bunch of other laws every, everywhere else. Um, this is obviously going to have reverberations beyond just, you know, FTX. Talk to us about what what do you think, you know, I, this may be beyond your pay grade kind of, but what do you think this has to do with the future of cryptocurrency? Oh, it's a subject I've thought a lot about. You know, I was talking to financial institutions before this happened and I and I was talking to them. They were asking me, OK, where do you think crypto regulation is going? I'm like, well, you have the SEC who seems really interested in regulating. I don't know if you remember, Kim, you know, they had this action against Kim Kardashian and the chairman yeah. of the, the, the SEC, Gary Gensler, had these like social media videos with cartoons where he's like, you know, this is what we're doing to regulate. Certainly seems super interested in regulating crypto. And then yet on the other side, uh, there's a CFTC, which is what the in, who the industry wants to be the regulator, a little smaller agency, smaller budget, a little bit less aggressive in, in terms of being, you know, maybe more and less anti-industry from their perspective. So there was just going to be this turf war and so on. I, I really think at this point, um, you know, th there was a caution that these regulators were doing. They didn't want to they didn't want to uh, maybe, uh, you know, rush in there too quickly. Uh, and they wanted to really figure this out. I think that there's there's actually going to be uh, more intense and aggressive regulatory attention here. And I think there's a concern from the people in the industry who actually are trying to be compliant. Ironically, they may pay the price here. They're getting painted with the same brush as FTX. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really going to, I, I think, change that industry dr dramatically. Uh, another kind of area of life it's affected is politics, because According to reports, SBF was the second largest Democratic donor outside of George Soros. Do you see any problems on the horizon for some of those politicians who may have accepted uh, some contributions from him? You know, maybe, maybe not. I mean, obviously, uh, people get, you know, contributions all the time from folks. I bet they're long since used. 
people's memories are short in politics, right? <laughs> right. Uh, right. We live in an age where, you know, everyone, you know, people are storming the Capitol and then, you know, they, we, they try to remember it later on, but then, you know, everything changes, right? We're already got a new news story. We had the elections. Now it's Nancy Pelosi. Then there'll be something else right. that happened. Right. So right. I, I don't know about that, but I think that, you know, certainly uh, a Democratic donor drying up obviously hurts the Democratic Party to some extent. Uh, but, you know, I don't think that's going to save save the hide of Mr. Bankman Freed. <laughs> no, I don't think so either. Um, all right. Well, we'll continue to watch this. It's fascinating. It's I imagine going to get even more fascinating as more of these details come out. Let's turn to St. Anthony, Idaho, where Lori Vallow Daybell has been found fit to stand trial in the last ruling on her mental health by Idaho District Judge Stephen Boyce. This is the second time that she has been declared competent in the trial after being released from a state mental facility. Previously, Vallow's case was paused back in October after concerns about her mental state indicated that she was not ready for legal proceedings. In other Vallow Daybell news, a judge has denied a motion to sever the cases between Vallow and her husband, Chad Daybell, and the couple are set to be tried together, though no court date has been set. Vallow and Daybell are charged with the murders of Lori Vallow's son, J.J. Vallow, only nine years old, and her daughter, Tylee Ryan, 16, who disappeared in 2019 and were found buried in June of 2020 on Chad Daybell's Idaho property. They are also charged with murder and conspiracy related to the death of Chad Daybell's first wife, Tammy Daybell. Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow shared extremist doomsday religious beliefs, which are thought to be motives for the murder. Um, Renato, interestingly, Idaho abolished the insanity defense in 1982. The law prohibits any consideration of a defendant's insanity in a criminal trial. Instead, testimony is restricted to issues of mens rea and other elements of the offense involved. So let's talk a little bit about that. How, how would this play out in court? So you have experts who are going to be allowed to testify, but they can't testify to anything dealing with insanity, only to mens rea. How do you, how do you see that playing out? Well, I think as a practical matter, it may be somewhat similar. In other words, instead of fitting it into the box of insanity, what's going to happen is the defense is going to put all these people up basically saying she didn't understand. She didn't know what she was doing because of X, Y, Z, A, B, C. And they're going to get all of this in front of the jury about her mental state and her competence and so on and so forth. And so basically they're putting before the jury. I mean, a jury, as you know, a judge, yes, they, they care about, you know, the legal legalities and what the judge is instructing them, but they also care about doing the right thing and they want to be fair to the person. And so, you know, if they can paint a sad picture, maybe they can pick off one or two jurors and have an, you know, have a hung jury. I would think that would be the, the goal on the defense side. But of course, there's also the issue, as I know you, you were flagging a moment ago, of whether or not she's competent to stand trial in the first place. Yeah. And we'll get into that. And I just wanted to to kind of dovetail off of one point that you made that um, the defense will likely present experts, I'm, I'm sure, to talk about her mental health. And they're not going to be able to make that ultimate kind of conclusion as to her being insane, nor will they be allowed to say that she wasn't able to have premeditated what she did here, because that's a question strictly for the jury, but they're going to try to attack that because that's really what it comes down to. Okay. She, you know, if she committed these murders, was she so uh, affected by some sort of mental impairment that she couldn't perform or, or, or form the proper mens rea mental state intent, specific intent, uh, uh, most particularly for first degree murder. So that's that's really how this is going to play out, even without an insanity, you know, NGI type of defense here. But let's go back to, like you said, this the idea of the difference between competency and insanity. So sh we've been dealing a lot of her with her competency before now. What what is that and how is that different from ins the an, an insanity defense? And so competency to stand trial is like a super low bar. It's like, right, right. Are you able to understand the proceedings, meaningfully participate and so forth? And so, you know, the way it, when I was a federal prosecutor, we always joke, well, I wouldn't say joke, but we'd always remark that essentially if the person is incompetent, they basically would send them to some facility and put them, put drugs in them and so forth and make them competent. I mean, it, it ultimately, it rarely results in somebody not being able to stand trial, but the idea is, so that the person's rights are vindicated, they're able to participate, they need to get to a spot where they're able to, you know, have conversations with their counsel, participate in the proceedings, testify if necessary, and so on. 
Uh, unfortunately, that for Mr. Day, for Miss Daybell, like that's probably not going to keep her from having a trial. Uh, and as you said, really, ultimately, you know, what's going to happen is, you know, this is going to play out in front of the jury. And, you know, the, the, the downside of not having the insanity defense is just that instead of arguing it straight up of, uh, you know, hey, she she was insane, they're going to have to try to dance around it and fit it within the mens rea elements. Yeah. It, and it, it, it's a. You know, you're dealing with such a tragic case here and it, the motives behind it appear to also, you know, make zero sense. It, it, I, I think it's going to be an extremely difficult case for the defense, um, especially dealing with, you know, the loss of children. Now we turn to Los Angeles and our ongoing sexual assault cases here. A jury of seven women and five men will begin their deliberations this week in Danny Masterson's high profile rape trial here in Los Angeles. The former That 70s Show actor is charged with three counts of forcible rape alleged by three different accusers with the incidents occurring between 2001 and 2003. All three women belong to the Church of Scientology of which Masterson is still a member. The women claim church officials intimidated them into keeping their claims secret. Recently, a fourth accuser who is not affiliated with the church was allowed to testify after Masterson's defense suggested the woman had colluded against the actor, the women, pardon me, had colluded against the actor and the church. Uh, closing arguments del were delivered on Tuesday, November 15th, and now a jury will decide on the charges, which could carry a sentence of, of uh, up to 45 years if Masterson is convicted on all counts. Um, first thing, and people always ask me about this, um, Renato, is the Masterson opted not to testify at this trial. How do you think that strategy paid out for the defense in this type of a case? Or is this one of those things where you just can't put your client on the stand? Wow, that's a great question. Very profound question that comes up in many, uh, if not yeah. most criminal trials. So the way I would th I think of it is as follows. If the defendant testifies, it really changes um, the calculus at the trial, it changes the question before the jury of the trial. In other words, if the defendant doesn't testify, then the question is simply, OK, you have all this evidence from the government. Is it enough? Does it meet some hypothetical, um, you know, proof beyond a reasonable doubt standard? And that's really the whole question before the jury. If the defendant testifies, then the question is, is this guy telling the truth or not? Do we believe his story or the government's story? There's literally two options. Whereas if the guy doesn't testify, there's a hundred different possibilities. The jury can insert whatever they think the most likely pot potential scenarios are. So what's better or not? Well, if you don't testify, I do think the jury, uh, whether they're in, they are always instructed not to do this, but the reality is they're thinking to themselves, well, why didn't this guy come forward and testify? You need to. I will tell you my last criminal trial against the Justice Department. I did not put my client on the stand. And in closing argument, I explained why. And I argued it to the jury. And I you know, I, I got 10 out of 12 jurors in that trial. I probably would have gotten all 12 if he testified, but I didn't want to take the risk there. OK, because there's a, a risk. If you're if your guy tanks uh, on the stand, then you lose. Right. If they think he's a liar, uh, then you've automatically lost. Right. The, the, you're giving a second uh, a second life to the government. So it can be in that case, there's an expression of confidence on my end. I thought I was going to win no matter what. Um, but it can also be um, the opposite. It can be that, well, your, your guy's got so many questions that he can't answer that your only hope uh, is to not put him on the stand and, and deal with, in this case, several accusers, which I think is going to be a real, real big problem for Mr. Masterson. Yeah, I, I, I'll go a step further. You say as, as long as your client doesn't tank, I don't even think your client has to tank. I think they just have to do a little bit poorly. I mean, one little mistake, one little error, one little... Uh, you know, something that can per be perceived as not being entirely truthful and jurors will latch on to that because they're just waiting for something to kind of hang their hat on. Really, a, a defense defendant has to knock it out of the park, I think, if they're going to testify, because otherwise, um, you know, jurors, jurors are looking for some sort of excuse from that person to say, oh, they're not being truthful with me. Therefore, I'm going to side with every, everything else the prosecution has put on. That's just kind of my experience. Um, let's talk a little bit about this, this fourth accuser that was allowed to testify, who is not part of the, um, charges, but did allege, uh, you know, prior sexual misconduct and was not connected to the church. The judge originally was not going to allow this witness, but said that the defense opened up the door by making the argument that the other witnesses had colluded with each other because they were against the church. 
I guess my question was, was this unavoidable for the defense or do you think they really dropped the ball here? Well, yeah, it's certainly not unavoidable. I think it's it, it's it, it's it's at worst a screw up, major screw up. It's at best a very calculated decision by the defense. So just as a backdrop um, in court, you're not allowed to have evidence about other potential misdeeds that somebody's committed that are not part of the charges are not allowed to be to come into evidence for good reason, because the point is whether the evidence is there to prove beyond a reasonable doubt what the charges are now, not to render judgment on a person's full full course of a person's life. Right. And so, right. So this ordinarily all this other stuff, all this other conduct, whatever he's done the rest of his life wouldn't come in. And, you know, I, I imagine if everyone was doing this right, um, this kind of was laid out in advance effectively for the uh, defense. In other words, the prosecution, they, they had to know the prosecution had other evidence out there or had to be concerned about it. Usually in a case like this, if I was prosecuting it, I would put a marker down for the defense saying, OK, judge, you know, we tried to get this in. You said no, but, you know, they could open the door, you know, whatever. If they argue X, Y, Z, I'm going to be arguing that they open the door to basically put them in a box, so to speak. Yeah. Give them a warning. Yeah. Give them a warning. Here's the line in the sand. Yeah. Yeah. And basically, so the the defense then had a choice. I mean, assuming that that was done here, they had a choice. Do you do you keep yourself in this box and your defense in this box in an entire trial, which is not a, uh, you know, sometimes a not an easy thing to do? Or do you, um, you know, or do you just take the fact that you're going to get this other evidence in? Like I said, at best, a calculated uh, choice here because the downside of making that argument, which maybe they felt like they had to make, is that, of course, now there's an, uh, a witness in that makes them look like they're they were misleading the jury. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I think it I, I think it was a mistake. I think it was a mistake that may end up being fatal. I mean, I'm, I'm saying that now we'll see what the jury actually thought of it. But to me, you know, letting this other person who's uncharged come in as this kind of surprise witness moment could have been de- devastating to the defense's case. Um, we had talked a little bit about this before we started to record, and I, I, I was really um, interested in your thoughts because a lo- these allegations are very old, 15 plus years old. And there was some testimony provided that you know they were um, prevented from coming forward to law enforcement by the Church of Scientology. But talk to us just a little bit about that idea of our modern kind of understanding of sexual assault victims and how we expect them to behave versus how they sometimes behave. Yeah, I think that there's an expectation that a lot of folks have that if you're a victim of a crime, particularly a serious violent crime like sexual assault, you're going to immediately report that to the authorities. Uh, There's a lot of evidence out there that actually a very large percentage, if not the majority of sexual assault victims do not report that right away. And and that's, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence. I think part of the power of that, the Me Too movement, for example, was just, I think a lot of us seeing, wow, all these people around us uh, who we know all the time actually were victims of something. And many of them didn't report and weren't, you know, di- w- you know ultimately didn't bring cases. Um, but but I think that's powerful. So so I think, you know, there's a lot of times what happens is in, in trials, prosecutors put in evidence to, a disabase jurors of assumptions that they make. I used to do this with fingerprint evidence all the time. I would put in fingerprint examiners to say, hey, there's no fingerprint on this gun. And here's why. And because we usually don't find fingerprints on guns and yada, yada. Basically, just to explain to the jury that their assumptions are incorrect. And so I could a lot of times I think prosecutors are doing that in sexual assault cases now and saying, hey, just because she didn't come forward right away doesn't mean that that she didn't that she wasn't the victim of a sexual assault. Yeah. That's a really uh, I, I like that tactic of kind of attacking your presenting your uh, perceived weaknesses up front uh, and, and taking kind of the wind out of it for what the defense might attack. Um, and the, the prosecution did have a pretty s- strong reason here when they're dealing with the Church of Scientology, which me- brings me to my last um question on this. In his closing arguments, Masterson's defense attorney said that Scientology was mentioned some 700 times during the trial. He said, quote, it became about Scientology. What do you think his point was there? Like, what, 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 what is this? Is it, is it just a diversion or what is the tactic behind this, you think? I don't think it's a, a smart and obvious tactic, uh, which is to basically say this is religious persecution. You always want to you, when, when you're when you're in a criminal trial, your client's been accused of serious crimes. And, you know, the, the jury, 
despite what the rules say, they're going to basically presume your client's guilty, not presume that the client's innocent if if uh, there's an indictment out there. That's just the reality. And so basically what he's trying to say is, how do you explain what happened here? And it's the, the explanation, the ready explanation is religious bigotry, that there's discrimination against his religious beliefs. And he's trying to, you know, he or she, the the the, uh, the lawyer's got to convince at least one juror of that. Yeah. And we'll see how it turns out. Um, it was uh, apparently a very... A short by most standards closing argument got straight to the point well and the jury is still deliberating so any day now we should hear the results of that case now moving down the hallway of that same courthouse we turn to um harvey weinstein jennifer siebel newsom the wife of california governor gavin newsom endured an emotional cross-examination from weinstein's defense the former actress testified about an alleged encounter that took place at the Beverly Hills Peninsula Hotel in 2005 in what was supposed to be a business meeting. Newsom alleges that Weinstein manipulated and penetrated her before she faked an orgasm to end the encounter. Weinstein's defense attorney asked Newsom to demonstrate how she indicated pleasure in front of the jury in his cross-examination of the witness. Newsom, visibly annoyed, retorted, this is not when Harry met Sally. I'm not doing that. Later, Newsom added, what you're doing today is exactly what he did to me in regards to the defense attorney cross-examination. Newsom also testified that Weinstein's unique anatomy, uh, or testified rather about his unique anatomy, which has become uh, a, a focus of this case. The defense uh, went on to drill down about Newsom's contact with Weinstein after the alleged assault, including thanking the former Hollywood mogul after he got her and a friend into an Oscar um, party. An emotionally shaken Newsom responded, I was just hustling. Uh, Renato, let's first talk about the, this defense line of attack when alleged victims have subsequent contact with their abusers. So we've talked about kind of delayed reporting. Now let's talk about when they go back uh, and we even have contact with their abusers and, and how people perceive that. And is that a persuasive argument by the defense? You know, it can be. It's it's definitely an argument that's very uh, frequently employed. Uh, I uh, at times had handled cases where there was um, s- sexual trafficking you know, the trafficking of minors and so forth. And the 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 perpetrators would convince the minors that, you know, that person was looking out for that defendant was looking out for their interests and they would have an intense, intense feelings about him because that was effectively they, these were minors, right, who were being groomed and cultured by them. And so actually a huge issue in a lot of cases would be almost getting them to testify against the wrongdoer and a constant issue is like, well, she said this to me. She did that to me. She was doing all these very positive things and saying all these wonderful things about me after the assault. So it couldn't have happened. I think it's a common issue in sexual assault cases here. Of course, there's a power dynamic. It's a different kind of power dynamic, but it's similar in the sense that Mr. Weinstein was allegedly taking advantage of the uh, power that he had. And, and, you know, at the time, Ms. Newsom was not the, first lady. She was somebody who was a, a relatively, I mean, say minor actress. She's not a super powerful actress. And my Weinstein was a powerful producer who's taking advantage of her. And so she couldn't afford to, to be his enemy and blow him off. She had to find a, uh, a way out of the situation that would preserve that relationship. And so they the defense is trying to take advantage of that. Yeah. Um, we don't have cameras in courtroom on this case, which is unfortunate uh, because it is uh, there is a lot of national attention on it for many reasons. Um, but from according to reports of people who have watched it, uh, the defense has taken the tactic of kind of no holds barred on this, and they're not holding any punches and um, being very aggressive of their cross examination of women who are claiming to be you know uh, victims of sometimes really awful sexual assault including with uh, Ms. Newsom who testified, asking her to demonstrate how she allegedly faked an orgasm in front of the jury. They'd had a pretty visceral response from her. Tell me, what what are your thoughts on that? Is, the, is this kind of the only path to, to go in these types of cases or is there a different tactic? How do you think that's uh, received by a jury? Just kind of jump right in. Yeah, sure. So first of all, I mean, it's certainly not the traditional playbook. The traditional playbook with a sympathetic 
uh, witness, uh, a hostile witness, like a victim or a, a young woman or so, someone like that, is to actually have kid gloves and approach it very gently and to slowly work into, um, you know, difficult questions, but do so in a way that doesn't appear hostile, doesn't appear like you're accusing the person of being a liar or something like that, but you're walking through the limits in their testimony showing how they could be mistaken. I've had to do that many times. It's often challenging. Yeah. Uh, uh, even, and it, it works. And it's the same when you're a prosecutor and you're, you're, you're uh, cross-examining the, the, girl, the girlfriend of the bad guy or something like that who is just you know, kind of up there and, and everyone knows that she's, she's not really the wrongdoer. He, you know, he, the thing that I think is potentially going on here, the strategic choice that they're potentially making is they may this they may decide that well if we do that to all these witnesses in this case we're network we're, we're basically it's a slow plea so to speak it's a it's we're basically pleading guilty we've got to take them down we've got to challenge them we've got to knock them down a peg it's very distasteful though and it's extraordinarily high risk and more it's more likely than not uh, going to piss off the jury and get them to find him guilty. And I think the only time that a strategy like that makes sense is when you're very desperate and you're likely going to lose anyway. And so you are basically taking a very high risk strategy in the hopes that you will, you know, convince one or more jurors, you know, whether it's because of misogyny or just they don't like the the witnesses or whatever it may be to, to vote uh, not guilty. Yeah. And it's difficult to kind of play, you know, Monday morning quarterback on on some of the ways that the defense team is handling this because we haven't seen how these witnesses are actually behaving in court because sometimes these witnesses as sympathetic as they may start out sounding can turn very hostile and kind of give the defense uh, permission to go back after them. We saw that I think recently and fairly famously in the Amber Heard cross-examination where the attorneys there didn't really hold back, but Amber Heard was kind of giving them permission in the way that she was behaving and answering questions. And we don't have that benefit of having the cameras in the courtroom here to see how it all turned out. It appears as though she was very emotional, but we'll we'll see how the jury um, reacts to all of it. Uh, last question on this. Um, the defense, has part of their theme has been that they claimed that this was all transactional sex and it was... Uh, part of a time in which, you know, uh, Hollywood was when Harvey Weinstein was at his most powerful. And it was all about being um, being granted access uh, and, and you know, to powerful men and powerful men in exchange for sex. It's hard to deny that that was a culture that existed in Hollywood. Do you think that this um, argument is persuasive? Does it hold hold water? Well, I think that some of the best defense arguments often appeal to the non-reasoning part of our brain. In other words, the sort of whether it's a bias, whether it's a pre-existing idea, something that just hits people in their gut. And for people who have, I would say, um, uh, you know, whether it's a prejudice or they have just longstanding views, it may appeal to them. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of good reason to believe it's maybe a distasteful strategy, but they're, you know, they're aggressively doing what they need to do for their clients. So I get it. And I think what they're trying to appeal to is a certain brand of juror who's going to think it's their, their fault. And it's, it's the victim's fault. And they, they, they were asking for it and they, this is what they wanted. And she knew when she went up to his room, what she was doing and so on and so forth. Um, and I, so I think, I did, I think it may make sense uh, for, as a defense strategy, but uh, it's understandably, you know, controversial and condemned by many. Yeah, certainly not, like you said, uh, the typical strategy that we see employed in these types of cases. But maybe this high risk will have high reward. We we shall see. I appreciate so much your comments, Renato. Thank you so much for coming on this week. Where can people find out more about you? Well, definitely everyone should check out my own podcast. Uh, it's complicated uh, with uh, my friend Asha Rangappa, who also does a lot of legal analysis, uh, my former Yale Law School classmate. Uh, and then you can also find me on Twitter, Renato Mariotti. Very hard to spell, but R-E-N-A-T-O is my first name, Mariotti. Uh, and you can find me uh, all over the place. If you Google, you'll find I'm a columnist in Politico and elsewhere. Fantastic. And I'm your host, Josh Ritter. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ and at JoshuaRitter.com. And you can find our uh, sidebar episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And we want to hear from you. If you've got questions or comments you'd like us to address, tweet us your questions with the hashtag TCD Sidebar. And thank you for joining us at the True Crime Daily Sidebar. <laughs>